Good evening, mathematicians and math enthusiasts. My name is Jeff Cook. I'm going to present a paper that I and my co-authors have been preprint right now, entitled A Direct Proof of the Riemann Hypothesis. If you're just stumbling uh, across this video, uh, this is the fourth in a series of videos that I've been putting up for the past week or so. Um, that discusses some of the background for um, not only those who are experts in the Riemann hypothesis, um, but also for lay mathematicians, uh, electrical engineers, uh, physicists, those who maybe understand mathematics but are, are unfamiliar with the Riemann hypothesis. I don't go a lot into complex arithmetic and discuss that, so I probably will put another video out later. But about about a year and a half ago. Uh, I made an important finding, and I've been working on the Riemann hypothesis for about 17 years. I made an important finding, and I approached uh, um, Greg and Dennis Allen. They're both accomplished mathematicians and very intelligent and nice guys. And uh, you could read Dennis's uh, um, experience on his uh, um, page at ResearchGate. And uh, um, so Greg is not on there yet, so, but uh, he has... Uh, um, written and edited numerous, numerous mathematical papers. And uh, um, and Dennis got his PhD at University of California, Berkeley. Okay, so accomplished mathematicians. And for the past uh, year and a half, we've been hammering away at this and simplifying it and uh, taking everything out of the proof that is unnecessary. Uh, anything that could be called into question has been removed if we can eliminate it. Um, and we're just getting to the the um, the heart of the matter. Obviously, it, it, it's very important for something like this to keep it very simple. Um, I understand if you're just landing here and you are, uh, as let's say you have some expertise in, in number theory, I understand your suspicions. Um, I respect them and I would have them the same if I were you. Not a problem. This video is to walk you through the paper, walk you through the proof and uh, um, and explain anything that may not be entirely clear with the paper. I'll tell you that this is the way it has been. Uh, I have been in contact with uh, a number of mathematicians and uh, um, uh, hundreds of mathematicians have had their eyes on this paper already and no errors have been found to date. We do know that there are no uh, incorrect equations. They are all correct. Um, but this is the common theme that I see when presenting it to mathematicians is the first read through is, yeah, I'm just not seeing it. And uh, uh, so then I, I talk through it and we go over the equations and then they come to the point where they go, yes, I see it, that's it. And I said, well, well how can I rewrite the paper? How can we you know, do this um, uh, to make it better? I said, no, it's right as is. And so I think this, this sort of thing, because of the suspicion uh, of an actual proof of this hypothesis so so large, it can you can gloss over equations, gloss over the points, and not not see it at first. It it, it goes by pretty quick. The paper, the proof is only takes up about five pages, uh, two pages of introduction, you know, before that, and two pages of the appendix. I mean, it's largely just five pages of proof. Um, so. We have discussed, I my co-authors have discussed that these videos uh, seem to be an important part of the next steps going forward because let me tell you a little about proof really quick before we get into this. Um, proof is necessary, essential for society to hold its fabric together, okay? We need proof for stability. It's necessary in court law, it's necessary in mathematics and physics or any, any of civilization to, to evolve, we need proof, right? So we all recognize its importance, but proof is only as good as you are willing to accept it, okay? Proof is different than facts. I have a lot of non-mathematician friends say, I thought math is, is black and white. Yes and no. Again, it is only, the proof is only as good as you are willing to accept it. That's a, a problem, right? So facts, are, they exist whether or not we like it. But proof is something, if I'm going to the court of law and, and, and uh, let's say I'm accused of some crime I didn't commit. Well, it doesn't matter. The facts are irrelevant, really. It's how well do I prove it to you, my innocence, you see? So proof is essential for society, but again, the downside is it is only as good as you can accept it. So we need to speak in, in, the, same, in the same language. 
Um, and it has to be done in um, a non-pretentious, concise, and clear way. And I hope that I'll do this in this video. If I fail, well, please forgive me. This is unscripted. So consider this a discussion. You and me sitting down at the table, we're going over this together. This is a discussion. So pardon the ums and the mistakes. Uh, um, I'll always edit over and I, I'll touch up if I have any mistakes. Uh, it, if I say something incorrectly, I'll just put a note on the video there. Uh, not a problem. But that is my intention here is to present the paper, go over it with you in a non-pretentious manner. All right. And the other three uh, videos are to, are to give background in the hypothesis because I do expect the majority of the audience of this uh, video are not experts in number theory and this proof is even understandable for that audience as well so okay well let's move on where where can you find the the uh, um preprint so it's been out out there for a few months now and it's at ResearchGate. um you do not need to have an account uh to download it you can just go google search uh research gate cook Riemann hypothesis it should be the first one to come up if not um just uh Go to researchgate.net, look up my profile, Jeffrey Cook or Dennis P. Allen, and you can get to it from that way. Okay, now, while you're going to get, this is going to be a premiere video, so it's going to be, you can't record it if you're watching this right now and it's if you're watching an actual premiere, you're not going to be able to pause this. So go get go get the paper right now. All right, go download it. And while you're doing that, I'm going to talk about um Something else that I think is, is equally important to society as proof, and that is dark humor. All right. So while everyone else is going to get their, their paper, I'm going to talk a little bit about my book. Uh, Woe to the Hunted, a second edition is out. I do think dark humor is important. I do not think, uh, if you're not sure what dark humor is, you may go, I don't want, I don't, I don't get kicked out of watching violence. And, and, and that's not, that's not what, uh, what I do and not, not the way I see dark humor. I do uh, see that dark humor can, um, look at life in a ho hopeful way you can't it's not all just a bleak you know dark outlook that's not what i see it as um i see it as illustrating a problem finding a problem illustrating it through humor when you make people laugh people are more engaged they can they can stay with you longer your point is clearer and while everyone else is going and getting their the, downloading that preprint uh, i'm gonna give an example because uh, i definitely want everyone to think about this we, you know i don't want anyone to be concerned that dark humor means you know it's just like unbearable it's not so give us an example all right the day the earth stood still so it's a dark film the aliens come and they're gonna um they're gonna you know exterminate the human species that's kind of like drama more than anything else all right so this scene here um the this the precipice scene where the alien which is keanu reeves is talking with the professor and the professor is like you know pleading with him you know but you're an advanced society you you could help us with their technology and he says the alien says the problem isn't technology the problem is you i cannot change your nature and so the um professor is pleading with him with arguments and saying well you know it's only at the precipice that that civilization gains the will to come together to solve its problems. The precipice being like a steep cliff or ledge. Okay, no humor in that, all right? It's a nice point, no humor. But you take that same thing, theme, and you can apply it to humor. The same exact theme is in Ice Age 2 with the dodo bird scene. We all know they're extinct, and uh, um, and, they're, and we have these dodo birds who can't fly. Uh, well, we don't know, but in the movie they can't. And they're going to go underground because it's the end of the world. And they're going to go underground for billions and billions of years, but they only have three melons, and, and they can't work together. They're fumbling it. They're falling off the cliff. And as the one falls off the cliff, the last one here, the one dodo turns the other, and he's there goes our last female. That is dark humor. So when I read this novel, that's what I'm discussing. Also, the Ice Age has this other scene with Sid, the, the sloth, and he comes across a primitive village of, of them, and they, they see him making fire, so they consider him the fire king, and they're going to throw him into the volcano, sacrifice him to the volcano. That's dark humor, right? So they, um, <laughs> they're going to sacrifice him, and he pleads the same exact plead as from the movie, um, uh, the day the earth stood still. He says, you're an advanced civilization. Surely we could work together and come up with a solution. She says, we already have a solution. You know, sacrifice the fire king. And he's like, that doesn't sound very advanced. And she's like, well, worth a shot. That's dark humor. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. I think this is important for the world. Get people engaged with some dark humor, illustrate the problem at hand, and, and get people engaged. When you, people are waiting for a joke, 
they actually really pay attention. So if you're really going to prove something in, in society, I'd say do it with humor. So that's why I'm a big fan of it. All right, I do have another book out. Uh, no, coming out soon, hopefully. I'm on the last chapter. Uh, it's a book on physics and accomplishments all involving light. So anything that uh, uh, mankind search for an understanding of light. And I discuss Faraday, Einstein, and, and numerous other. Maxwell. And I think you might like that one comes out. Hopefully I can get that soon. Okay. Everyone got their paper? Red pen? All right. Probably no one will actually want to find it. But I'm going to give that time anyway just in case. All right. Good. How to prove the Riemann hypothesis in less than 10 steps. All right, we're going to do it in yeah, about six or seven. Um, and uh, um, we're going to just do it. All right, remember I discussed the uh, in the last video. If you haven't seen the other videos, go check it out. All right, just go check it out. We we're talking that uh, we now have the resources to prove the Riemann hypothesis. If you haven't watched the video, let me just summarize really quick. We're looking at um, the hypothetical. If, all right, so the, the Riemann hypothesis is that all the zeros, well, one way to say it is that all the zeros of the Riemann zeta function have real part one half. They all lie on this critical critical line. And it's actually the equivalent consequence of the actual hypothesis, but it still works. So all you need to do is, is you find a non-trivial zero off the critical line, you have proved that the Riemann hypothesis is false. Okay, so this area, this complex plane really quick, uh, real line going horizontally here, those are the real numbers, one, zero, minus one, one half, pi, um, all of those numbers. And you have an imaginary, um, an imaginary uh, axis here, and um, imaginary is not really any more imaginary than the real line. That's imaginary as well. Um, it's just a bad term. Okay, and the critical line is right here between zero and one, and that would be it's it's term given to the uh, um, based on the hypothesis. It's a kind of a term like there. No mathematicians generally don't consider that line the critical line only when discussing Riemann hypothesis, and this is uh, described as the critical strip. So imagine a strip of tape going all the way to positive, ne negative, imaginary affinity between zero and one. And we do know today that all of the non-trivial zeros lie of the Riemann zeta function lie within this area. If you're confused so far, definitely go check out the other videos. I start from the very beginning of the zeta function. All right, but let's go here. We in the last video, I discussed how we now have the resources to prove the Riemann hypothesis, and we're going to do it. And we're going to do it by, by if these have to be symmetric. All right, so Riemann's symmetric vertices property is something he, he found that shows if there are any um, non-trivial zeros off the critical line, then they must occur at the vertices of rectangles symmetric across the real line and symmetric across the critical line. So they would, you could, you could say that the, that rectangle is internally tangent to a circle um, centered on the real point one half, which is right here. Okay, so if you find any non-trivial zero off the critical line, you instantly get four more uh, for the price of one. Okay, to date, we don't know if any of these exist. This paper is going to prove that they mathematically do not exist. Okay, so... Beginning from page one, I'm just going to quick read through the abstract. I'm not going to read the paper. I'm going to show the paper. All right, but I am going to read the abstract. A function upsilon of s is derived that shares all the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann, of Riemann zeta function, and a novel representation of the uh, Riemann zeta function is represented that relates the two. From this, the zeros of the zeta function may be grouped according to two types. That is when upsilon of s equals zero and upsilon of s does not equal zero. Just two, those two groups. We're going to place them into all those groups. All right. From that, a direct algebraic proof of the Riemann hypothesis is obtained by setting both functions to zero and solving for two general solutions for all the non-trivial zeros. So we're going to solve. For the, we're going to find the general solution for all the zeros of the zeta function, and then we're going to find them for all of the non-trivial zeros as well. Okay. Now, really quick, first equation here, if you watch the other videos, is the uh, um, how the paper starts. It just starts discussing this is the uh, the zeta function is the analytic continuation of the generalization of the harmonic series. This function right here is the generalization of the harmonic series. Okay, now I'm going to discuss a little bit of, of this. All right, so we talked about the symmetry, right? We have to go ahead and put that into a mathematical expression somehow. We can't just say that all the non-trivial zeros 
you know, ha- on the vertices of, you know, rectangles, you know, all that. It, it's too much to say. And you have to actually mathematically prove it. So we're going to take one property of that. Let's do it for this property here. Um, we're just going to say if the zeta function equals zero, or all the non-trivial zeros um, off the critical line, they must share imaginary parts. So the distance here to here and the distance here to here are equal for these two guys across here. All right. So we can say the absolute value of this distance, the absolute value of this distance are equal for these guys, and same for here. But we're going to just deal with these. We're only we're going to sum uh, the the Riemann symmetric vertices property into that and the fact that this distance from here to here and the distance here to here add to one. Okay, that would be the same as if they're symmetric. If these are symmetric, then yeah, we, we can take the distance here to here and the distance over here to here, and you see how we should add to one. All right, but if, and then we can just ignore that, assuming it's symmetric, and that's what we're going to do. Um, so if they're symmetric, these that distance here to here and this distance here to here will sum to one. And we're just going to, and that's the paper right here. We're just saying that right here, okay? And we're going to call that little equivalence for each of those as Riemann's symmetric vertices property. That is the definition we begin the proof with. All right. So here, all right, imaginary parts are going to be equal when the real parts add to one half. Okay. That will give us the symmetry of the zeros to the zeta function through real point one half. So take a line from this one down to here, and it's going to go right through the point one half. If this was out here a little bit and, and we take it, it's not going to go through the real point one half. Therefore, it's not um, a, a zero of the zeta function, much less a non trivial zero. So we're going to discuss that. We're going to go over that. All right. Let's, in the last video, I said I'd like to begin with the end in mind. Okay, so let's go to the back of the paper. Flip all the way to the back to the path, very far to the back to the appendix, okay? In the appendix, we have a little bit of a, a primer, okay? And how to decode the outline, all right? Now, the paper is independent of the outline. Outline is not independent of the paper. So you could read the paper, the proof, and you don't need to reference the outline at all. But I am going to go through it because the statements are are a nice way to see how the paper follows, okay? So I've had, uh, um, I have had mathematicians uh, say to me something in the early, you know, when I first put this out with them, and they're like, oh, you need to lay out the steps and show, you know, say, present, the, you know, you're going to do this and that and the other. And, and I'm like, no, I don't. If I'm going to prove that I can go to the, t climb to the top of the Eiffel Tower with a rabid monkey on my back, I don't need to lay out any steps. I just simply need to do it. All right, it's the same thing with math proofs. I don't need to lay out any steps. But, you know, obviously, you know, I, I get it. We need to speak the same language. So I put the steps as an appendix, okay? And and then the other discussion came up with the symbols, okay? So if you don't know the language the paper is being written in, you're not going to understand. So, okay, so I, I put this, these symbols here are only in the appendix. They're not in the paper. The proof of the paper is purely algebraic. But these statements sum up what we do in the paper, all right? And so you're going to, if you really want to, you want to understand the proof, follow through what we're doing here. And I'm going to give a little bit here. So I discuss, I just basically decode everything at, at the beginning of the appendix. And then I go through, and here's the outline that's in these terms. So basically what we're going to do is so understand that a premise that you build off is something different than a step, okay? So, um a step is, um, well, as you're, you're moving and you're going step by step. You know steps. Premise is, is a statement, okay? So this is, these are the statements. And, and these, these symbols are very useful for making um, uh, logic statements, okay? So we're going to go through all of them, all right? And then at the bottom, I give the reasons why each of the, how each of these are proven. And you see they're very, very easy proofs. Um, so... The first one, we're going to prove the zeta function equals the right-hand side of this. That's all we're going to do. And and how do we get that? Well, the definitions of algebra, trigonometry, and complex arithmetic. That's 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 how we prove it. And the second um, one, well, we prove it because of the implications of P1. So we're going in a straight line because of the implications of that and because any number zero, z multiplied by zero is just z. Right? That's easy. Um, and then the third one follows from the implication of two. And because zero has no reciprocal, and you see these are very, very simple, you know, reasoning. So I don't need to create new math to present this proof. It's it's just all as a direct proof. Boom, 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 done. 
Got it? Makes sense? You will understand it. Before we get into discussing these symbols, and I don't know how far back to go, maybe 50 years, okay? So some of you may be a bit older than that, and you know, studied college, you know, back, you know, maybe a little longer than that, and maybe you didn't, you didn't see them. This is a great video here. This Go to this channel. Um, I really like it a lot. They're talking about a proof by construction. I think they have five different proofs in there to help illustrate it. And they discuss some of these symbols there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just basically copy the way they started or began um, and, and take it in a different direction because I'm not working with a proof by construction. But definitely check out this, this video. It's kind of nice and I like it. I hope they come out with more. And if they do have more, then I want to see it. I really like it. Okay. Um, so the the Riemann hypothesis, the problem is is an existence problem. For instance, if I want to prove that the Riemann hypothesis is false, all I need to do, it would suffice to exhibit um, a, a non of zero off the critical line. If I just say, hey, this, this value right here sends the zeta function to equal to zero, and it's in the critical strip. Done. It's proven. All right. Good luck finding one, though. All right. That it, but so when proving the existence of a single thing, it suffices to simply exhibit one. For instance, two headed snakes exist, and I think in the other um, video they they did white white peacocks, you know, and uh, so it's done. Present it, it's done. So nothing more to argue about. All right. However, proving the Riemann hypothesis is true is different because now you have to prove an infinite number of them it's, it's all the real parts are one half this is a little bit harder um so well actually it's not harder because the other one's impossible as you'll find out all right so um but when proving for every there's the symbol for every when proving for every element of some relevant set that there exists some predicate that relates one element to another in some meaningful way it helps to place the elements with a certain predicate and those without into two separate sets that are related to each other in some other way. All right, so let's go over. You saw what I just did here? All right, that's all the terms. You can review this video then. Right here, this statement. Let's just talk about, let's say y is a zero of the zeta function. For every zero of the zeta function, let's say a and b are solutions. For every zero of the zeta function, there exists two solutions, A or B. And what is the predicate? That they are zeros of zeta function. All right, so that would be the solution A, solution B, and how they're related, these, these are solutions to that. All right, that's, that's all this is. So this is the set, we're placing them. So we want to take all of the infinite number of zeros and place them into two groups, you understand? So in the appendix, we go through all of the symbols like that and describe it. But that's basically what they mean. And with that, we're going to explain every P that leads up to Q. All right. The first uh, thing we're going to prove as we go is simply that zeta function equals the right-hand side of this, such that A of S equals 1 over S minus 1, B of S equals minus 1 over S minus 1 to the power of 2, and uh, C equals 1 over S minus 2 to the power of 3, and omega of S equals simply I times the complex conjugate of S. All we need to do is prove that by rearranging Riemann's functional equation. Okay? The second one is kind of along the lines of what we are talking about just a second ago. All right? For all the zeros of the zeta function, not just uh, the trivial, not just the critical, all of them can be grouped by this um, in terms of upsilon of s. That was, or upsilon of s was that sec this, in the second term right here, okay? All of them can be grouped in terms of that because simply if you let zeta go to zero, it, it reduces by, it reduces to that, okay? The third one. Now we're saying for all the zeros of the zeta function, there exists two types, where upsilon of s equals zero or upsilon of s does not equal zero. We're simply going to group them in terms of upsilon because all of the solutions are can be defined in terms of upsilon, all right? All of the zeros in terms of upsilon. Now we're going to group it, divide it down into two groups. We're going to put all of those into two groups, when upsilon is zero and upsilon is not. And those are the two types of zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Got it? Fourth one. Now we're going to talk about upsilon. 
when you apply an upsilon, a non-trivial zero of the zeta function to upsilon, and it equals zero, we're saying we're going to prove that um, where you know the row is that non-trivial zero, we're going to prove that the real part equals one half of that non-trivial zero. It's a necessary condition for that type of zero. That's type one zero. Okay. Now, p5 and p6 are just kind of reversed of each other so let's just go through it really quick for every real part of a non-trivial zero equal you're not ah, so let's just simplify this <laughs> for every critical zero there exists upsilon of that critical zero equal to zero so but all the non-trivial zero all the critical zeros are also zeros of upsilon okay critical then it is a necessary condition a necessary condition for upsilon to go to zero. Then we're going to kind of show the reverse implica implication of those two, um, that the real part of non-trivial zero equals one half if and only if upsilon of that non-trivial zero is also zero. So they go back over the horse. So if you have upsilon of rho equals zero, then we know the real part of rho is one half. If we have real part one half and zeta function is zero, then we have upsilon uh, also going to be zero. That's what we're going to prove there. Okay. And that just says that all the type one zeros are critical zeros. We put them all, all the groups. So that's what we're doing. Now, I know that means that we only have one other type of zero, uh, as we're going to show, because we only grouped them two types. There's upsilon equals zero and upsilon not equals zero. So all of them must be the other type. All right, non-trivial, trivial, or not trivial off the critical line, and so on. Okay, P7, this is where it gets right off to, to the hypothesis, um, and everything follows very quickly after this. All right. For every non-trivial zero, hypothetical non-trivial zero off the critical line, I mean, it doesn't have a real part one half, for everyone and all the way to infinity, there does not exist this counterpart that is a reflection through the real point one half. There is none exists that are critically symmetric. Got it? We're going to prove that there is none. And then, Quickly follows that then, well, for every non-trivial zero, there does not exist an upsilon that is not equal to zero. There are no type two non-trivial zeros. If there's no type two non-trivial zeros, well, then they all must be type one trivial zeros. All for every trivial non-trivial zero, upsilon of rho equals zero. It's a necessary condition, which is like stating basically what? That the real part of all the non-trivial zeros equal one half because if there's only two types the first type is all real part one half and the second type of zeros of the data function are all asymmetric across the critical line then they're mathematically impossible and we will show how the, it, it will become a lot clearer all right that should be pretty clear but if it's not don't worry it's okay that's i mean everyone's going to be approaching this from a different uh, background and different experience and, and so some of that is not going to be clear you will understand that i hope okay so the final statement is going to be that uh, all the non-trivial zeros have a real part one half does that make sense that's the appendix all right so we're stating how we're going to do it now the paper begins with a little discussion on on riemann's uh symmetry of the non-trivial zeros okay it follows from his xi function okay so if you want to learn about this go watch the second video and i, and I discuss riemann's findings there okay um, it, Want to keep this more focused on uh, um, the proof, but you want the background. I give a little on the paper, but this is all just background, okay? All right. Then I discuss a little bit about the motivation. Why? Why am I putting it in this form in the first place? What is the matter? Well, because there are only two types of zeros in this form, and uh, um, and let's just show. I did go over this in the third video, the one right before this. So we're looking for an alternate form of zeta function. All right, I, there's, I don't know, at least a hundred um, out there. Okay, and none of them gave me the, the tools that that I wanted to do, you know, to approach proof. So, well, we're simply going to find our own. All right, so one alternate form of, of zeta function, and we want it to consist of just three terms. Why? Because when you set that equal to zero, there are only two types of zeros. The first type of zero is where one of the terms equals zero and the other two terms negate each other. And that type has a geometric representation of a line. 
So very nice, easy solutions. They all line up on this line. Now, my thought is, why? Well, well, kind of, what if we could rotate that line and translate over to the critical line? Wouldn't be, that be nice? And then we could have all the type 1 solutions on the critical line. It's a nice way to separate them. That's the motivation talked and discussed in the paper. The other type, the only other type for 0 equals a plus b plus c is where um, one of the terms, now I'm not saying it needs to be b or c or whatever, one of the terms does not, uh, none of the terms equals 0, and two terms negate the third. That's the only other type of 0 for this. All right, and that has the geometric representation of a plane, and the plane happens to have, count them with me, one, two, three, four, five, six points, and six sides, not necessarily equal. All right, so that right there is not too unlike the Riemann symmetric vertices property on the complex plane. Count the zeros with me, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now you see the motivation. So now there may be a solution here where we get this one and then and, and get these two in a quadratic or these two in a quadratic or these in some other way, which are on the critical line. But they're all going to be reflections of each other through the real point one half if they're actually zero of the zeta function. So we draw a line from here to here. It's going to go right through the one half. Draw a line from here to here. It's going to go right through this point one half. If there's one up here, one half. Okay, so that is the motivation for this form. We're going to turn that a plus b plus c equals zero to the critical line on the complex plane all right that's the motivation then we get in the paper to the claim all right that's probably the only other thing i read in the actual paper all right oh i'll, I'll read a little bit sentences though all right let rho be a non-trivial zero so you can see where i'm reading right here the claim let rho be a non-trivial zero of the Riemann zeta function, and rho h is a hypothetical non-trivial zero off the critical line. Given only two types of zeros of the Riemann zeta function, such that the first type contains all the critical zeros, that is, they have the real part one half, and the second type does not comply with Riemann's symmetric vertices property, which I'll discuss. It doesn't comply. The second type doesn't comply. Then the Riemann hypothesis is correct all the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function have a real part one half. All right, now we are going to, um, you know, call Riemann symmetric vertices property uh, this equivalence, all right? So we're going to say that the imaginary parts are equal and the real parts of these pairs, the real parts um, add up to one. Okay, cool. All right, let's then go to uh, P1. All right, so... All we're going to do is just basically show how this is done. All right. And this begins on page three. We're beginning with Riemann's functional equation. And I'll show you that in a second uh, if you're unfamiliar with it. And we're going to take all of the rational properties of this functional equation and absorb them into this new function. We're going to squish them into upsilon of s. So that upsilon of s relates to... Um, uh, zeta function by ra purely rational functions, all right? And none of them can go to zero. None of them can go to zero, all right? And uh, so simply an algebraic factor of each other, all right? And uh, so here's what we do. We're just going to do that and move them out of the way, move all those rational properties out of the way. Begin with the functional equation. There it is. And you see rational meaning like you have a pi and you have a sine of pi is over two. All of these, we're going to get them out of the way and, and put them into one function. All right, let's do it. Multiply both sides by s minus 1 to the power of 3. Subtract both sides by 1. Multiply both sides by i. Watch the left-hand side as we're going forward. Add minus 2 times the imaginary part of s to both sides. Multiply both sides by sine of argument of s. Now, you, if this were um, anything other than an algebraic proof, we might some of you might have a problem with the um, upsilon of s with these uh, absolute values, uh, but it is algebraic proof, so we don't need to worry about whether or not upsilon is analytic. Okay, so we end up with the absolute value of s in the denominator and imaginary part in the numerator, and I'm going to add this big old chunk <laughs> to the right-hand side, 
2 times imaginary part of s, all times 2 times imaginary part of s plus i, all times cosine of argument of s. And we're going to eliminate that and the absolute value and the imaginary part of the numerator by dividing both sides by sine times argument of s times accomplished conjugate of s. You see, kind of all just reduced out of there, and we're very close to being done. Divide both sides by 2 times s minus 1 and give the right-hand side of the equation a name the name upsilon of s. And we're going to solve for zeta, solve back for the zeta function, expand, and we have our result. Now, uh, before we break this equation apart a little bit, let's just look. I don't like the i and s complex conjugate all this way it is, so we're going to clean up a little bit because i times complex conjugate of s squared equals minus complex conjugate of s squared. We could just call these things the same thing and then just the second one squared. All right, so these are all the same. And because I don't want people asking what is is, um, we're going to give this i times complex conjugate of s a name. Uh, omega of s. There, so it's very nice and neat. A little bit neater anyway. It's still, you know, it's kind of a wide open skeleton looking type of equation, but that's what we want. All right, so the first term, so each you got s minus 1 in all of these terms, right? And they're all reciprocals of s minus 1 to some power, okay? So 0 has no reciprocal, so therefore this term cannot go to 0. This term cannot go to 0 because if, remember, um, it's time, i times complex conjugate of s. All right, if we let s go to zero, this would go to zero, but this would be undefined, and that wouldn't equal, you know, zeta function or zero, even if it was zeta function. So um, the only term that could go to zero is the second one, like we were looking for. And the only property of this term that could go to zero is upsilon of s. And in fact, the, it is the only irrational part of the function. See, everything was just condensed into upsilon. We took all that out and put it in upsilon. Now we have the resources to prove the Riemann hypothesis. All right, let's give the analytic continuation of the geometric series, which these are, let's give them names, and of course, we're gonna call them A, B, and C, all right? Because we're looking for A plus B plus C equals zero. Now we rotated it, you know, and, and moved it to the complex plane, so we're gonna get these coefficients and an upsilon of S, um, but essentially it's still the same thing. All right, that is done. That's just by the rules of uh, algebra, trigonometry, a little complex arithmetic. That's done. All right, the zeta function equals that. Okay, good. Now, P2. All right, this is um, discussed and, and proven in a single statement on the end of page five. All right, because S minus one times the zeta function uh, minus one equals minus one, whenever the zeta function equals zero in the numerator of two, if you look to the, back to page, or, you know, the, the last page, equation two, equation two reduces to this, all right? That's all we get. We get these this little solution. So you have it right here in terms of the a's, but if you want to look at just in terms of s, explicit form, there we have that, okay? So, and and that, for, that says for all of the zeros of the zeta function, this is our general solution. All right, in terms of upsilon. All right, good. All right, so here we go. Set it equal to zero and reduce. That's all it is. Simple, fun. Now, third one, uh, two groups. This is equally easy, right? You can almost just pretty much see it from, from before. It's on the same equation, all right? So we're just going to group upsilon in terms of zero or not, all right? And uh, so reduce zeta to zero. And we have these two solutions, upsilon is zero or upsilon is not. All right, we discussed this earlier. Only the second term can equal zero. All right, so only the second term can equal zero, and it's only because of upsilon we can discuss all of the zeros of the zeta function in terms of upsilon of s equals zero or upsilon of s not equal zero. And it gives us everything we need to know about the zeros of the zeta function. Well, not everything. I mean, of course, we don't know what their birthday was or anything like that. Okay, type one. All right, there's type one. All right, upsilon of s equals zero and zeta function equals zero. Done. Type two, it's not equal to zero. It's as simple as that. All right, we're just going to group them. Okay. Now, <clears throat> fortunately, those are easy and some others are as well. Almost all of them are very easy. The last one's a little bit more, but not too much. Okay, uh, here we go. Now, remember, we're going to prove that whenever upsilon 
of non trivial zero is zero, well, it's going to have a real part one half. All right, we're going to prove it. It's not that hard. All right, this occurs, uh, um, I'm not sure what page it is, um, but uh, it's right after the other section. And uh, let's go through it, how it works. Okay, so we set the zeta function to zero, and we're going to set the epsilon equal to zero, right? So the second term goes away. Now, this little sum is going to be equal to the right-hand side of this equality. And this right here is equal to the right-hand side of this equality out of rules of complex arithmetic. And now let's look to the numerator. That's where the zero is going to come from. It's not going to happen from the first parenthesis because i times 1 minus 2 times i times the imaginary part of s has no zeros by the rules of complex arithmetic. It must occur in the parenthesis to the right. So we set that equal to zero, add one, divide by two. You realize how easy this is, right? This is simple. But what did we just state? That type one contains only critical zeros. It's a very big result, with very simple math. All right, and I like that. Now, why is this why is this hard to find? Well, all problems are hard to find when they're in the dark. Okay, it's only when the lights shine on them that that, that it becomes very easy. All right, so we now have just proven it. All right, that's done. All of the uh, type one zeros are critical zeros. Okay, there's only one other type of zero. This is why we're so close to the Riemann hypothesis at this point. There's only one other type of zero, and all we need to do is prove that it's mathematically impossible for there any um, to be critically symmetric. That's it. Here we go. We're gonna combine. These are gonna kind of in the paper they fall from the consequence of of uh, um, uh, one step okay both of them these statements fall right out of it okay so if you remember uh p5 is that uh, um that now we in the last one we showed that whenever epsilon of rho is zero real parts one half we want to show that it goes both ways okay so we can think think of one in terms of the other if we get a, a, a critical zero we're going to get epsilon is going to be zero all right we get epsilon is zero i mean because we're talking about a critical zero that's all we're going to do and very easy all right so that we get this reverse implication of the two which means that real part of a non trivial zero is one half or is critical or, no sorry the non trivial zero is critical if and only if epsilon equals zero all right so that's on page six um it follows from this and we're going to do it all right but uh, um let's see if i no i don't do it. i gotta go through it really quick all right so we in, in equation six, we have the uh, um, the general solution, but we're discussing in terms of epsilon of s not equal to zero. So we're going to solve for the real part of s, and you get a quadratic. You see here's the quadratic in the paper, all right? And you see why epsilon of s cannot be equal to zero because it's the denominator of the type two solution. The type two solution is going to be undefined anytime epsilon of s equals zero. And since we just showed that real part, if it's real or part one half, then we got it going both ways. So if we have a zero, it's going to be real part one half. It's the only one argument that sends zero to uh, epsilon of s two. I'm sorry, let me back up. In that solution for the zeta function, it's it's only um, epsilon of zero is related to one half. But in this, we see that epsilon cannot be zero in the type two solution, and because of that, we get the reverse implication. Okay, so that a zero is critical if and only if epsilon of s equals zero, right? So the denominator can't be there if it's zero, so we get that reverse implication. Done. If you have any concern about it, it's, 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 very, it's very simple stuff. I mean, but if there's any question about that, because uh, I'm kind of doing this just on the spot, if I didn't explain it well, please let me know. I'd be happy to explain it, but this, this one's easy. All right, good. Um, so where are the symmetric vertices? All right, so we're talking about all this symmetry. We, we want to see them. This is where many people make gloss over the paper. You got to start playing around with the equation, equation seven. All right, we need to start looking at that. That's that's the type two solution. That contains all of the trivial zeros and all the non-trivial zeros if they exist off the critical line. There are, there's only two solutions. So if you go back and watch the video step by step, you'll remember, you know, there can only be two solutions. This is the second solution. So all the non-trivial zeros are in here, and and we just got to shake them out. So the only way to get familiar with this is is really just start plugging in some values, and, and let's do that a little bit of that. 
All right, so in the paper, I kind of slow down the proof here a little bit to give a little background on this because there used to be a lot of discussion. And we just kind of cut out all this fat, cut it out, cut it out, and um, we left a little bit of description there. But it's, it's don't want to gloss over this, okay? The this the symmetric vertices property, all you can see with this, and I'll show you how you do it. Okay, first start with the inside the square root here. All right, because these are the can also be expressed as the right hand side of this. We're going to apply that in into the, the square root, and we're going to solve back for upsilon of s. All right, so um, and we're going to solve for the uh, um, real part of s. All right, let's go and uh, flip through this. We're going to end up with this result. All right, upsilon uh, of s. All right, it occurs when Upsilon of s is not equal to zero, and the zeta function is is zero. All right, <clears throat> this will give a total of four possible hypothetical zeros, two sets of pairs across some of the real and critical lines from each other. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're also going to get two different upsilons. You see the plus and minus. You're going to get two different upsilons. All right. One for the complex conjugate. One's of one, and then so you're going to get a pair that corresponds to one upsilon, and you get another pair of the other, you know, there's four of them that correspond to different upsilon of s. So we got two upsilons, four arguments on that, on that uh, symmetric vertices diagram. Now, here we go. Using the type 2 solution, let's just go through it. You know, when we discussed because of this equality, we can we can swap that out and describe the real part of s in this way, and we're going to solve back for upsilon of s. Get this quadratic for upsilon of s. Now, using six equation six, which is the general solution. Of course, we're, we're speaking in terms of of upsilon of s not equal to zero, but it's obviously identical. Um, but we're going to set those to equal to each other, right? And we're going to apply some arguments to the left hand side. All right, let's use um, one fifth plus i over seven. Okay, and that's going to give a value right there. We can find the value um, of that, the right-hand side is going to equal that, but not terribly important for what we're going to do. All right, let's just take that. I just look really carefully if you can't see it. All right, so the other equation, we're just going to apply this equality, leaving all of the S's on the right-hand side, and uh, go to wolframalpha.com. It's a little free online calculator. You can do it there, or if you have your own software package, that's great. Do that there. Um, and a uh, um, little note, if you want to do I can't. I wish I had a place to, you know, give you the plain text. Just copy and um, copy and paste all of these equations. Uh, I don't have a website currently, but I'm probably not gonna get one. Um, but if you were, if you want to do complex conjugate of s, just kind of put like a caret uh, to the star, and then you can just copy s, you know, all the way through, and then just put it wherever it's a complex conjugate. So um, if you're not familiar with Wolfram Alpha, that's how they're they're using that. Cool. All right, and and. It handles it very nicely. It's going to give you your two solutions. We already know one fifth plus i over seven, but we're also getting the other one. So let's let's uh, um, let's uh, go ahead and plot those points. These are our two arguments, and let's see. We can check. We can check to see if these are actual zeros of the zeta function. Um, we can check it by the symmetry. We don't even need to apply them to the the zeta function. We said zeta function equals zero. But this we're going to check by symmetry if they're real zeros. All right, so we'll plot the first one. Okay, that's the one fifth plus i over seven, and we're gonna we're gonna plot his partner across the critical line, and he's outside the critical strip, which means of course they're not symmetric. He's inside the critical strip and he's outside. But also, if we draw a line from here to here, it's not going to go through the real point one half. Therefore, it is not a zero the zeta function. But I'm going to keep playing around with this so that I can you can get more familiar with the 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 rest of it. But we know at this point that it is not a zero. Okay, but let's go back and let's do the complex conjugate of that. Right, to find the other. So we're just going to change these signs here, the plus and minus, to each other, and we're going to apply that back in the same way. And we're using the negative solution again, but unfortunately, no solutions exist for this one. It's an extraneous solution, so no big deal. We're going to go ahead and apply the positive um, of the quadratic in there. And because we're going in the dark, we don't know if it's the positive or negative solution at this point. We don't know if it's extraneous. And apply the positive, and cool, we get both of the solutions pop up at the same time. They're both positive solutions. They have two different values. That's kind of neat. Cool. And how do they line up on the complex plane? 
well, let's plot the first. Um, good. And we see that they are at the vertices of um, rectangles, and they are symmetric across the real lines, but they are not symmetric across the critical line. Therefore, they are not zeros either. Okay? You see how that works? All right? So if they were zeros, they would be symmetric across the, uh, according to Riemann and, and, and his work, you would, they, if they're zeros, they're going to be symmetric, and they're going to they're be reflections of each other through the real point one half. So we draw a line here. Is it reflection through real point one half? No, it's not. Okay? Makes sense? We're working on a little bit more because I think you really need to understand this, this equation, this part of the proof. All right? Now, the Riemann symmetric vertices property, we are defined, we defined it as, we could, you know, it, it's defined already, all right, as, uh, um, as that, it's a long statement. If there are any non-trivial zeros off the critical line, they're going to occur at the vertices of rectangles symmetric across the real line and symmetric across the critical line. That's a mouthful, okay? And you know it is. All right, so let's give it a mathematical property, all right? We're going to take one aspect of that that is going to hold true in that case and it is this this is a definition that's why i have the d there all right so the imaginary part of the um those directly across the critical line uh you know horizontally from each other um it's a zero if those imaginary parts are equal and the, the real parts add up to one all right that is the same way of saying that uh, you know that one way of saying what he said. All right. So look back. All right. So we're talking about these guys here. All right. That's all. Now we're going to, um, you know, apply the special case in there to show you what we mean about adding to one. Okay. We know this is not going to add to one because it's not a zero, but let's just do it anyway. And again, we're talking about those guys across, not these guys down here. We're just, we could discuss this, um, Riemann's, these vertices in many different ways. We're just going to choose this one because it seems to be the simplest way. Well, that's not, not the simplest, they're all simple. Um, this one is the has the fewest amount of equations to get to the final result. All right, good. So let's add it up to one. All right, so we know that their imaginary parts are equal. We see that, right? We can do the math and we can check. We see that, you know, if they were a zero, let's pretend we don't know that they're not zeros yet. All right, we're going to see, and let's pretend we don't have this line here and we can't tell if it's symmetric. We don't know. Our eyes are really bad or something, okay? And we're just going to apply the math to check. All right, so we're going to check to see if the real parts add up to one. And we'll apply the uh, um, the one, and we're going to apply. We we'll forget we say we don't have a calculator handy. We don't know if it's one minus this. We just know this value came out of the equation, and we're going to apply it to the real part here and add it to. Does it equal one? No, it does not equals one thousand one hundred seventy seven over seven thirty five, which does not equal one. And so we would say that this these arguments do not comply with Riemann's symmetric vertices property. Got it? Now we can test any, any arguments uh, to see if they're zero in this way. And we can test it because we can test the equation itself to see if any zeros, type two zeros, comply with Riemann's symmetric vertices property. We actually can, and it's not that hard. So let's do it. But in this case, we're going to say neither of these are, are zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Got it? Make sense? You have a little bit more understanding than before you read, read it. I want to give you one other thing before you go, before we go to the next step. All right, symmetry, and I don't know if this is the best way of saying it, but it does make sense. Symmetry increases the closer the arguments get to the critical line. So if this is an argument here and we, and we, we get closer, uh, well, let's say we go further away from 1 6, 1 7, 1 8, we go out this way towards 0, this guy is going to be shooting out to infinity. See, as this gets closer and closer and closer to one half, you know, one fourth, one third, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. <laughs> I can't do less than the harmonic series. All right. Um, this guy is going to zip in here and get closer and closer and closer. And that should be very uh, <laughs> telling. That, that indicates something very important right there. The further we go away from the critical line, less symmetric. The closer we go to the critical line, more symmetric, okay? This suggests the Riemann hypothesis, but it doesn't prove it. And there's enough suggestions of the Riemann hypothesis out there, so let's just nail down the proof, okay? Good. P7 is what pretty much does it. And uh, um, this is saying that 
for a, just to remind uh, for any non-trivial zero, any hypothetical non-trivial zero off the critical line that doesn't have a real part one half, there does not exist a counterpart that is critically symmetric. All right, there is no other pair in this pair that's critically symmetric by the rules of mathematics. We're going to prove that. All right, that is done uh, in this section of the paper. Um, I don't actually write out all of the, the solution because there's each equation. At this point, it comes down to how do you want to calculate it yourself? All right, you can apply it to Wolfram Alpha, you can apply it to Derive 5 or Mathematica. It, it, each one is going to be slightly different, and I'll, sh I'll show you why. Okay, but it all is proven by these in, the, in this sentence, and let's just go through how you do it. All right, so we this is what we're going to do, all right? We're going to take that um, quadratic, okay, of the real part of S. This is the type 2 solution in terms of real part of S. Okay, so we took the uh, upsilon of s, we we just solved uh, well upsilon when zeta is zero, and we solved for the real part of s. We get a quadratic. Okay, so you remember this, all right? And and, and just re refresh a little bit of memory, so we get really familiar with this equation. We have upsilon denominator, so therefore we know that upsilon cannot equal s or zero. Sorry. All right, good. So we want to do this with for the pair. So this guy and another. All right, and we're going to call this his pair, his partner, not a real part of 1 minus s or 1 minus s. We're just going to give s, make it more general. We're going to, we're going to look for any number, see if it's possible for any number, even if it's not 1 minus s. And uh, um, let's see, we're just going to call it big S, all right? We're going to call it big S. Now, believe it or not, this calculator is, no, they can handle this pretty good. All right, so what is all is we're given a statement of equality. Real part of s equals this quadratic comma real part of big s equals this one and then comma we we define a and b comma and then we're going to say give us the solution for all of these conditions including this one where the real parts add up to one equals one believe it or not technology has come a long way all right so we can solve this in one fail swoop all right but let's describe a couple important aspects all right all right we got little s and big s it just means there's two s's they could be related. They might not be. All right, that's all. We could call it S1 and S2, but uh, you don't want to plug that into certain. I don't think Wolfram. Every time I put S sub script one into Wolfram Alpha, it, it, it spits it out at me. So we'll do little s and big s. All right, it's two different s's, and and we got same thing. Um, well, let's first talk about this imaginary parts. Okay, so remember from in. in we're talking about the pairs that are uh, positive pairs. Remember, above the real line, and they're horizontal to each other, you know, along the, the real line, and uh, um, they have to have the same imaginary parts. Okay, so obviously the, we could just sit there and swap out. We could say, uh, you know, imaginary part of S is is on both sides. All right, in both of these. All right, we could say imaginary part of big S in in, in both of them, um, but this. Uh, it nails down because this is part of Riemann's symmetric vertice problem. They have to be equal. Imaginary parts have to be equal. All right, good. So what is the other um, symbol in there? It's just big upsilon, just like we're doing with little s and big s, okay? So there's two different upsilons, right? And well, let's just say we don't even know there's two different upsilons. We're going to see if it's possible for any two different arguments, x and y. Let's just say it's, it's anything. Is it possible in any case, all right? And so we're going to do big upsilon, and we're going to do it in wolf of alpha. It should handle this very, very well. And then the A's and B's, these are simply the signs. Remember, it's plus or minus, and it could be plus or minus one on both sides. Uh, you know, this could this could be minus, this could be minus, this could be minus, this one plus, you know, four different possibilities. We're going to sum that up by doing A squared equals one and B squared equals one. Um, Wolfram Alpha didn't like this very much, uh, um, so you kind of got to do it each one by four, or two four times. But Derive Five handled it, and I'm sure Mathematica can handle it fine. Anyway, let's do it. We're going to solve for it. Oh, yeah. I do apologize. The most important part. All right, I almost forgot on this slide. Oh my goodness. Um, yes, they have. To, we also looking for that they sum to one. That's the main thing. The real parts have to equal one. When the imaginary real parts have to equal one, when the imaginary parts are, are equal. Okay? Real parts sum to one, imaginary parts are equal. That's all we're checking. Give us the answers. Give us the non trivial zeros. All we want to know the general solution for all the non trivial zeros are on the next slide. There's no real solutions. There's none. None exists. You see that? 
None exist. Now, Wolfram doesn't like the A and B, so I took it out and I need to just kind of go plug the signs in. So you have to go do all four of them and check to see if there's any solutions for any of them, okay? There's no solutions. Drive 5 spits it out and says it's an empty set for all four of them because it handles A's and B's, okay? There are no non trivial zeros that are symmetric to each other that are off the critical line. There's none. Mathematically impossible. What does that say? That says for every non trivial zero, all of them, there does not exist any type two solutions. It's not a possible condition. What does that say then? There's only one other type of zero. All the non trivial zeros must be type one. And all the type one have a real part one half. And that is how you prove the Riemann hypothesis, Riemann hypothesis in less than 10 steps. If you have questions, please put them in the comments, all right? If you like this research and you'd like to see more or um, like a little more one-on-one -on -one feedback, you could always support me at Patreon. Uh, I don't do this for money. I'll do it because I love it. Um, but I do, uh, um, obviously, research uh, funding always helps push research further. There are, are some neat results that follow from this, all right? I'm not going to get into it now. One of them I will tell about because we do have a paper in preprint, Greg and I. Um, it's a single statement argument of the complex. Uh, Single statement uh, um, of the complex argument, okay, that follows from some of the geometry we're doing here. If you see from the other videos, a lot of this was discovered um, from trigonometry. So um, it's not, not a groundbreaking uh, uh, finding, of course, by any means, um, but there are typically 12 conditionals that are used um, to solve for the argument of complex number. Well, this reduces it to a single statement. Um, so that kind of follows from this. There's also some very interesting um, findings that I have. I can't write about now, but they have to do with elliptic curves. Um, that's going to follow. And there's some other interesting aspects uh, be, um, that follow, which you can get a hint of in the last video in terms of physics. Um, very interesting stuff with this uh, that follow. There is a lot more. Um, like I said, I've been working on this for 17 years, so there's a lot of information I found that uh, led up to this. Um, but obviously, this is a paper on the proof of the Riemann hypothesis. And if you have, um, a, if you like it, and I really appreciate you, you know, working through it with me. And uh, um, and I hope you have a very good day. Take care, and uh, I'll see you in the next video.